trying to keep it a secret, but she's giving it all away. I couldn't keep a job. I still can't. That's the reason I'm retired. Uh, but I've had a lot of fun trying, and I've done a lot of different things. Uh, I think that's just because I've got a short attention span. If, uh, if you enjoy today, thank Freddie Fussell and, and Kathy. If you don't blame them, it's all their fault. Because several years ago, I've just been a, <clears throat> I've been a lifelong lover of history. Uh, my family came in here in 1834, and we never left. My great-great-whatever-grandfather uh, was a carpenter, and he ended up building steamboats, and in his obituary he said he either built or helped build every steamboat that was built on the river. And he even had a patent on some uh, steam engine parts, so I guess he did more than just build the boats. But I grew up in that environment, and, and I grew up in the old... Uh, I grew up in a little shotgun house next to the old home place, which is uh, in need of repair at that point in time, but that's a different story. But I just grew up around it, and I loved it. Now, my grandmother, I'd ask questions of, and she'd say, oh, honey, that's, I don't know all that stuff. And I just had to dig and dig and dig, but that got me asking questions, and I've been asking questions ever since. And at 75, I'm still learning every day. I find out that history is a big jigsaw puzzle and I find out new things every day. I also find out things that I thought I knew that I realized I was wrong after all these years. And Jesse Williams and John Lupole and I spent a lot of time still doing this and it's just amazing. But I was asking a question to, uh, to Fred and Kathy on the river walk when we were there just about every day watching the progress with the with the dams being breached and I was asked a question and he looked at me and said, Right, why don't you just talk to John Lupo? And I said, if I had his number I would. He said, I'll get you his number and I think it was Fred's way of saying, please don't bother me anymore. <laughs> but that leads up to today because John gets aggravated sometimes and he's the authority, not me. And uh he gets aggravated sometime and I think uh, he told Elizabeth that he was tired of people talking about the river and they didn't know what they were talking about in the history of Columbus and the early history of Columbus and they just needed to, to learn more about it before they voiced their opinions. And I think Elizabeth said, well, come on down and tell them, John. And John said, I'm not doing it anymore. You call Rod Hinton. And why me? I don't know, but you're stuck with me this morning. And again, if it's good, it's Fred's fault. If it's if it's good, it's Kathy's fault. If it's bad, it's Fred's fault. We'll just leave it at that. So we're going to get into it and talk a lot about the history of this area, which this is one of the most historic areas in the country. Before I do that, I do want to make one introduction. When I said I'm not, I'm not the greatest authority in the room, I'm not even close. And there's probably a lot of you in here that know more than I do. But there's one person in particular I want you to know because most people in this town don't know him. Everybody knows Lupo. Lupo's brilliant. Learned, I still learn from John. I take great pleasure in teaching him about Alabama, though. But that's a different story. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Alabama perspective today, too, and the Gerard perspective, because you can't separate the two. But through John, I got to know Jesse Williams. Now, some of you in the room that are really into history, you know Jesse Williams because you call him when you have a question because he, John and I both have doctorates and we'll tell you in a heartbeat, Jesse Williams is a better researcher than either one of us and we think we're pretty good, but not as good as Jesse. We got questions, we go to Jesse. Those of you that are knowledgeable in local history know Jesse because you've asked him questions. Those of you that know a little bit of local history have probably heard his name, and those of you that don't know Jesse Williams, he's going to kill me. Stand up, Jesse Williams. I want y'all to meet the man and the legend. This is Jesse Williams. Give him a hand. There's not anything about local history you can't... If you say, Jesse, there was a deed in 1932 uh, that was somewhere in Alabama, and it involves such and such. Can you find it? And Jesse, about 30 minutes, to call you back and say, yeah, it was executed here, there, and there. This guy is absolutely brilliant, and he's added so much to our knowledge of this local area. Everybody needs to know Jesse Williams. 
All right, we're going to talk about the road, the river, and the railroad. These are all very critical, and we're going to talk about some things. I'm going to tell you this. <clears throat> we're going to tell a story. And I'm going to get into a lot of dates, and numbers, and facts. And we're going to tell stories. And we're going to talk about dreams realized and those denied. And we're going to talk specifics. And I'll document some things for you. But this is the reason we're here. And we're going to talk a little bit about all three. To start off with, this river is, is the reason. And this is the last of the Coweta Falls. And these falls actually start... Uh, the Coweta Falls uh, start up around uh, north of the, uh, well, up around where Oliver Dam is, and they come in this short distance, the last two and a half miles, there's full falls. They're basically considered the Coweta Falls, the last one being the one right below the 14th Street Bridge. What creates these falls, and falls all the way up through here, is a 38-mile strip from here up to West Point that this continuous falls, and then, as you well know, you've got, you've got dams all the way up with, with Goat Rock and uh, Botless Ferry and, uh, and the dams at West Point. But what happens right through here is the fall line. It goes from Columbus, it goes to Augusta, and it goes all the way to the east coast. And this is where the Piedmont meets the plains. This is where the geology changes. I took my grandson on a, on, down to Westfield, uh, Westville the other day as part of a college course he was taking and we went through there and he was walking down I said look under your feet son he said yes sir I said you see what you're walking on he said sand I said you're walking on the ocean bottom buddy and it was pure white sand because this is the old ocean line climate change is real but it's not new I mean this is the old ocean line and it's what makes this place so special. Uh, if you think about where you're standing, if you want to just think from, a, from a, the soil in any direction, I mean, it's sandy. It's flatter. Now, there's plenty of hills, but it's flatter from here up. But right here, if you want sand, go this way. If you want rich black, black belt dirt, go this way. If you want clay and rocks, go up here where I live and try to dig a hole. But right here is where the Piedmont meets the plains. And that's what makes this place so valuable. So you can get in a boat here and you can go anywhere in the world. That's what was happening early in our history. So you got two advantages. I studied under a guy named Oliver T. Ivey at Auburn who I loved. And he always emphasized in history, in life, everything starts in a place and within a time frame. So this is the place. And this place and this geography and this geology is critical to why we're here and what happened. So here at this last plain, this is, this is the last of the Coweta Falls. Again, you can go south from right below this area, but you can't go north unless you're going to use pole boats, uh, pole boats that you have to take in and out. We got another thing happening here. In our history, there was a path that went right south of here that eventually became the Federal Road. Now for years, I always thought about this path as this was an old Indian path that they turned into a postal route that ended up into a road that ended up into an Indian war, but that's, that's just the latter part of it. And then somebody made the point that, that I should have thought of never crossed my mind is that the Indians didn't create these paths. We followed the Indians, but the Indians followed the animals. And historically, if you go back far enough, what really happened here, the Indians were smart enough to follow the path of the animals because the animals figured it out first. What did they do? They walked the high line. They walked the ridges. They minimized the amount of mush they had to walk across. They minimized the number of, of rivers or streams they had to pass. So this path actually in the Federal Road ends up going from Washington City, as it was called at the time, down to North of Mobile and over to New Orleans. But it was just a path 
that the animals used, the Indians used. And then in 1805, then we started negotiating treaties to create a postal path. The reason being is that <clears throat> the only way to get through Indian Territory prior to the Federal Road to get, in, in, think about it now, in 1803, you got the Louisiana Purchase. So this thing, the, the United States just doubled in size. So not only do you have to get to Mobile and to get to New Orleans, but now you got that whole Louisiana Territory opening up. And the only way you could get there is to come down, go through Nashville, go down the Natchez Trace to get down to Mobile or get over to New Orleans. That was it. So, you, so Jefferson starts negotiating. And Hawkins is his representative here. They start negotiating with the Indians for just a postal route. We don't want to do anything except allow the postal uh, riders to go with their horses down this path and get the mail because you can get there three days quicker, 300 miles shorter than going down the Natchez Trace. So when I stand here and look at this, one is a his, history major and a history lover. The first time I got to go to Istanbul and I stood there at the Bosporus and I looked at it and I thought, what a treat this is. This is the crossroads of the world. I mean, this is where the east-west land travel crossed and the Mediterranean to the Black Sea water routes cross. This is the reason the Russians are bombing the Ukraine now, one of the reasons over this same piece of land that's, that's involved a part of it, the Crimean that's just north of the Bosporus. The Bosporus, the crossroads of the world. But at this point in history, this was the crossroads of the world in the sense that you had this water route and you had this land route going across here. So one of the things that's most important to us early on is that we're at a crossroads and we're at a transportation hub here. Now what I'm going to tell you, and I'll just go ahead and give it away, but we're going to talk about it in a little more depth. We gave up, we gave up a lot more than we got. And that, did, that kind of disintegrated on us because there's some issues with this too. But well, we're in the crossroads of the world. You can get across, I've, I've gone all the way across Alabama from here to St. Stephen's following the, the Federal Road. There's places you can follow it, places you can't. And there's ways and there's a, there's a lot of history that's between here. And you can see the depth of these gullies where the roads passed. Eventually, in 1811, this road got negotiated and it got widened. Uh, and it was one of the roughest. This is a really nice way to travel. Most people are just on horseback still or with wagons. This is pretty sophisticated right here. You got Mustang and the, uh, his brother-in-law that are running these routes. And this was the first mass transportation by land. Uh, but in 1811, when they opened this road up, it opened up more than just the ability to get out west. Settlers started pouring through there and staying. The Indians were okay with some of the early things, but now this is where the upper creeks and the lower creeks start to split because things get tough at this point in time because they're coming here and staying. Here's the, all the treaties and all the dates that I won't bore you with. Treaties where when Oglethorpe came over here, one of the first things he did when he settled in Savannah, he came over here and met at Coweta Town and forged an agreement with the Indians that if it allowed him to settle there, he wouldn't progress any further. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, 1733, 1773, 63, these are all different treaties. Till you get over here in 1826, or actually in 1825, the last piece of land is given up, and that's the land that's uh, in this area where we live and the Coweta Reserve uh, was part of this land which count, uh, encompasses uh, several counties today. Also in that same time point when the, after that treaty was formed the legislature uh, was passed that, the, the legislature meets in the capital which is Milledgeville 
And in Milledgeville, they decide that they're going to create a town in Columbus. Why not? you got all this water power. you got people that, in Milledgeville, you've got people like Seaburn Jones. Seaburn Jones was an attorney in Milledgeville. <clears throat> and Troop was the governor when Lafayette comes and makes his famous uh, tour through this part of the country. Seaburn Griggs, uh, Seaburn Griggs, I know Seaburn Griggs. We, a lot of us know Seaburn Griggs. Seaburn Jones, <clears throat> Seaburn Jones was assigned the responsibility of guiding Lafayette over to Fort Mitchell where he handed over to Chili McIntosh who took him through Alabama. So when he takes him through, he sees all this and he knows he wants to be a part of it. And he ends up being one of the first people over here. But then the legislature, you got him, Ingersoll's in the legislature. A lot of the earliest settlers of this area were in the legislature. And they saw the water power, the transportation power. They set this town up. First thing they did was survey it. This is the original survey by Thomas. Now, this is in, uh, this, this is in 1828. And this has caused some confusion. Now, I don't know when. This is what I call the 1828 map that's not 1828. This is 1828 map. It was the original layout of the town, and as you see out here, it was a whole, what was called the Coweta Reserve, surrounding it was surveyed at the same time. Okay? This map has to take place later, and we're going to talk about, because <laughs> this was still, in 1828, this was still Indian Territory. This is Marshall's Reserve, which didn't happen until after the treaty in 1832 that we're fixing to talk about. This couldn't have been there. A lot of this couldn't have been there. But the original town was laid out, and it was laid out with green space all the way around it and a promenade, which is marked down here on the river. And it was pretty well thought out. Now, the only part of this green place space that's still a green space, obviously, is the South Commons. South Commons still exists, but the ra railroads really took the rest of it away and we'll talk about that and how that happened. Because when they came in, they took over. So what happens on the Alabama side, several years later, the same thing was happening, except it's working this way. And the last piece of land, major piece of land, there's a little, there's a little Cherokee land that was given later, but it was all part of this. In 1832, the last piece of land was given up by the Indians, and that's what allowed... That's what allowed this to occur. This was, uh, this treaty in 1832, like I said, it's the last piece of the Indians that move out. And a lot of this goes back to the 1826 treaty, and let me go back to it just a minute. The 1826 treaty, which set up Columbus, McIntosh had signed that treaty. McIntosh was a powerful man. Uh, a lot of people say he was half Indian, half European. He really wasn't. If you want to get into these Indian chiefs, you need to understand that the reason they have these Scottish names, and some English, most of them Scottish names, their fathers were traitors, their mothers were Indian. The trick there was for an Indian, the Indians were matrilineal, which means that they traced their lineage through the mother side. So to be an tr uh, a Indian chief, you had to be the son of a mother who was in the win class. Didn't matter who your father was. As a matter of fact, the Indian tradition was once you were born, your uncle, you lived most of your life in your mother's family's home, and your uncle is, was, had the responsibility of developing you uh, as a man. There's some exceptions, but that's the tradition. So these Indians were a lot of times half Indian, half European. But most of the leaders by the time we get up to 1826, they weren't half Indian. They were a very small percentage, probably some uh, an eighth, some maybe even a sixteenth. If you go back, let me just take one family for a minute. 
The French got as far in Alabama as Fort Toulouse. Fort Toulouse was where the Coosa and the Tallapoosa formed the Alabama. You'll know it most commonly now where the Indian Reservation uh, uh, Casino is over north of Montgomery and Wetumpka. That was Fort Toulouse. The French man that was the commander of Fort Toulouse, he married an Indian, a wind class Indian, and her name was Sehoy. And they had several children. One was a daughter whose name was Sehoy. That Sehoy had a daughter whose name was Sehoy. So in history, you refer to Sehoy and Sehoy II and Sehoy III. Macintosh is a descendant. And each one of these Sehoys married Europeans. So when you get down and you follow Macintosh's genealogy, he's in most Indian an eighth. He's probably a sixteenth, but he's most the least amount would be an eighth. Chili McIntosh, his son, when he met Lafayette at Fort Mitchell, he participated. He was dressed as an Indian. He participated in the games that was given for him there. They traveled. He stayed an Indian to, all the way to Montgomery, and his secretary records when they were in Montgomery that the night of the big ball, there's this dashing young man that all the women want to dance with. And, and Lafayette asked the, the secretary, the male secretary said, who is this man? And the, and the secretary said, it's Chili McIntosh. You've been with him for three days. He didn't recognize him. McIntosh is called the white chief. He's more white than he is Indian. He's more white than he is uh, brown, dark, whatever you want to say. You want to add another dimension to this? Guess who his cousin is? His cousin is Troop, the governor of Georgia. Troop, who wants to get the Indians out, and McIntosh, who's a lower, uh, a lower Creek chief, he's negotiating these treaties that gave up all this land, and this is McIntosh. He's giving up all this land, and he's getting land personally, and some of the chiefs are getting benefits. For example, if you go back to the Federal Road, when it was a path, all the Indians, some were for it, some weren't. It wasn't a big issue just to let them come through. When they wind it into a road, it got to be really sticky. Now, the lower creeks live around here. They're more intermarried with the Europeans. They're more tied to the Europeans. They tended to fight with the Europeans and then fight with the Americans. The upper creeks tended to fight and decide more with the Spanish. Uh, they fought with the British against the Americans, and then they fought on the other side against Jackson at Horseshoe Bend. So the upper creeks were saying, cut this out. We're giving up our land. We're giving up our traditions. So you got the upper creeks fighting the lower creeks after, after 1811, and the roads widened, and the people start coming in in, in, in masses. McIntosh, when he signs the treaty in 1825, the Upper Creeks have had all they want. They done told him not to give any more land away. So what do they do? They, a uh, big warrior who lives over not too far from uh, Hutsboro in that area, big warrior is the leader of the Upper Creeks. He was all for the first treaty in the postal route going through, but he's had his bait now. They've done, told McIntosh to cut these two years out. They said he wasn't authorized to do this 21 treaty and then the 25 treaty. So after the 25 treaty, big, big warrior sends um, Minowa, who's one of, he's a, you, you got, this is a tough son of a gun. They send Minowa, who's land that after the war was promised that he would have land that's now under the Lake Martin until after the Second Creek War and he got sent out west with everybody else and they took that away from him. But they sent him and 100, I've heard 150, I've heard 200, I don't know the exact number, Braves, up to McIntosh's Reserve, which is a state park in Georgia. And if you haven't been up there, it's a day trip and it's a great one. They sent him to to uh, McIntosh's reserve and they killed him. 
that was the end of Macintosh. Chili Macintosh stays on. So there's a lot going on here. Now, going back to 1832, there was an Indian, partial Indian. We don't know what percentage. He may have been half Indian, half Scottish. His, daddy was, his dad was Scottish. I think he was half Indian, half European. Named Ben Marshall. He had a couple of brothers. His brother Joe had a ferry that ran across down by Fort Mitchell to get back. The Canards, who were kin back to the Seahoys, had a town, a little village, and a ferry that went down where Oglethorpe Bridge is here before the town was ever settled. You know, they were all kin. Uh, ben Marshall has a house where the Russell County Courthouse sits today. And he had mills, he had all kind of uh, farmland in what is Phoenix City, Girard area today and out around Holland Creek. He was an interpreter for the Treaty of 1832 and also a negotiator. And as a payback for that, this is the Treaty of 32, and it says here, and there shall also be granted to, by patent to Benjamin Marshall one section of land to include his improvements on the Chattahoochee River to be bound by one mile in a direct line along said river and run back for quantity. In other words, to be the equivalent of a whole section. When you're doing all this surveying, you've heard of links and these are, these are links. They, they, it's like a big measuring tape. It's not that simple, but you got a compass, you got the stars, and this is the way you measure all this out. But here's the original drawing of Marshall's Reserve. And it ends up being interesting because, yeah, let's go back. Okay, I thought I had my map's position a little bit different, but here it is. Here's the river. This is, this is Holland Creek. It's called Mill Creek. Today it's called Holland Creek. There's a mill site here and that mill is still there, pieces of it. And I'm going to show you a picture of it. He also had a mill site up here, Fran, right where Godwin lived, where your grandmother lived. He had fields all out here. When they surveyed all this, and that was part of what happened in the Treaty of 32, they decided that they're going to take all this land from the Indians, but they're going to sell it in the name of the Indians. But the first thing they're going to do is cut out marshals. Well, he didn't get a section. He got a piece of four sections because it had to include his improvements. So you got section 10, 11, down here is 14, 15. He gets a piece of all of them to be the equivalent of a section. And he turns around, and Ben Marshall, to his credit, what he does is he sells it immediately, and he goes with his people out west and was the leader out there. <coughs> but, if you all next time you go down to the engineering office, there's a little crack in the fence right in the corner back there. And if you walk through that crack and you look down, you'll see the base of this mill pond, that's dam is still there. Okay? So I don't know, I know that Marshall had a mill out close to uh, the end of Marshall's Reserve, which is out near where the, uh, where the old chicken combs was. Uh, it was right out there. Uh, and I think he had one here as well. Although I know that right here the Niles brothers bought this land when it was sold because what happened The, once Marshall's Reserve is, is, is divided off, uh, the Niles brothers bought this and they made, uh, they made grain here and that was one of the earliest meals serving Columbus. In fact, that's who they served. There wasn't many people across. 1832, as soon as they did that, they built this bridge. And this is where God and then King come in. They built that bridge you say, oh, that's wonderful. They wanted to tie Alabama and Georgia together. They wanted to, to tie the two communities together. No, that's not what they wanted. 
I've told you about the land. Where's the best cotton land? It's in Alabama. Jesse and I have done a lot of research recently on Oswichi Bend. Oswichi Bend was some of the best uh, cotton land anywhere in the south. So they want to get that cotton over to the Georgia side and then load it on boats and then ship it down to Apalachicola, put it on ships, and send it to England. They weren't trying to get the cotton over here for the cotton mills. There were no cotton mills. They weren't even sending most of it up north. They were still sending it at that point in time to Manchester. You know, they're shipping it all the way over there from Columbus, Georgia. So they immediately build this uh, initial bridge, and I, I'm assuming this is a picture of that bridge, but it could not be. It was a lattice-style bridge, which is this lattice work inside of it. So it was a bridge like this. <coughs> right after they do that, they build the wharf, which is where the wharf is today. You didn't have the, the wall, that, the, the rock wall there initially. That was done later. There was actually a second loft, uh, wharf that most people don't know about called the Mary Freeman Wharf, which was a really rough uh, wharf down near Canards, down near the Oglethorpe Bridge. But you had a couple of wharfs, so they would get those wharfs in. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to make sure that they kept Alabama out of this equation and get the land, to get, get the property, uh, get it shipped over here. I'm going to read to you a couple of things about this rivalry. If I knew where my glasses were, I'd read it. They're leaving them in there. They've got to be there somewhere. All right, here it is. I was running out of pockets, Chuck. I had to find it in a minute. All right. Early on, here's the rivalry. This is December 32 by the legislature of Alabama. The county of Russell was the... Uh, was then formed. This is out of Martin's History of Columbus now. This is not somebody from Alabama. It says the county of Russell was formed in, and we find early in 33 some apprehension prevailed in Columbus that the county seat would be located on the western bank of the Chattahoochee uh, immediately opposed to Columbus and that would be the first movement toward the establishment of a rival town. Now the people that's coming over to form this rival town are Columbus people. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You understand that. These people are, they, they weren't just popped up out of the ground over there. These are Columbus people versus Columbus people at the time. Then you go on over and it says, We've learned from some of the owners that the property has been purchased with a view because what happened, Marshall immediately sails to McDougal and Collins, the whole Marshall Reserve. It gets divided up in lots and it's being sold off to guess who? Columbus people. Okay. We've learned, and that includes my people, we've learned from one of the owners that the property has been purchased with the view of establishing a town on the opposite bank of the river and with the design of enjoying the advantage and facilities afforded by the falls for milling and manufacturing purpose and those present uh, are presented even more by uh, uh, the election of a bridge. Keep on going. This is Leupold's book. He says, Columbus Bridge on the Alabama was important to the state. Its early erection uh, uh, assured that Columbus, rather than a potential rival on the Alabama side, would become the major trading post. That's the reason it was built. In the 1880s, many Alabamas viewed their side of the river at Columbus as the site of a city that would equal Columbus in size and economic importance. Go on. Last thing I'll read, back to Martin said, Martin is making a contest with Columbus. This is later on. This is 1838. Making a contest with Columbus for the trade for the surrounding area. The people over there had a fine wharf opposite Columbus in early in April, and the first steamer, the Francis, discharged 100 bales of freight upon that wharf. Ooh. These guys are building this town over there, and they're competing with Columbus. And the, boy, and the war is on. Well, what happens? Well, a lot happens. Because in the result of all that going on, in the cotton trade, and the cotton, this is in front of W.C. Bradley, the cotton brokers are trading on down. That's the bank's warehouse. 
This is Fontaine's house. He was the first mayor. And I'm going to come back. Remember that house. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in a minute. <clears throat> Go ahead and jump at it. If you want to see where we are today, is we're right in here somewhere. Uh, we're probably right about in here. If you go down to 11th, that was the Fontaine warehouse. This is Fontaine's house, and that's Fontaine's uh, office building, which is they still it's part of the Columbus State called the Fontaine building. But he and his his uh, father-in-law Stewart are a couple of the wealthiest guys in Columbus. They're cotton brokers, but they got involved in a lot of other things. But here we go. Now we've, we've divided. This is Marshall's Reserve. It's been all divided up, and we're selling these in lots. Okay? We've got Columbus laid out. We've got a bridge going across. So what happens is City Mills is built up here. Now this is slightly different location than where it is today. This is just north of where it was. Now this land was actually surveyed at the same time by the federal government to create an armory there to build guns, ammunition. And the only reason they didn't build it there, the water power was there, everything was there, but this area is too isolated. There's no good transportation. Remember, we got the federal road. That's important for people going in and out, but it's, it's terrible, terrible traveling. By now, Seaver Jones has come, and he's not, a, he's not a miller. He's a lawyer. He does all kind of other things. But he starts Columbus Mill. The dam ran across to this island, down between the islands, and across here. And the mill was up here a little north of where it is today. It was up here. And then you see where this land is, right here where the railroad track goes across. This is where Ingersoll built his dam. These are two buddies from Milledgeville. They didn't have a problem with each other. The original dam up here didn't even go all the way across. The original dam was a weird dam. It just went halfway out. Ingersoll had one that went halfway out. They went up here because they're out of the city. They're not having to fight the city government or anything else. They're on the other side of the city. Up here, they start complaining when these water lots are sold. Because down here, Columbus has got a problem. All right, the boat traffic is fine, but you've got these water lots built here, but the water goes on this side. So if you look at it, This is Ingersoll's today. This is where Ingersoll did. If you look at it, this is what this is what it looks like. So what are they going to do? This is when the water's down. The water goes this way. This is rock all uphill, and this is where they eventually try to build a wall and a dam to get the water over here. Now, Howard and Eccles and a bunch of other people get the rights, and we, I'm running out of time quickly but to get into any more detail, but they, they got the rights to these lots. First got you know, the odd ones and then the evil ones or vice versa. But they got a lot of money in building these walls and building this system to get the water over on that side. Ingersoll gets... They start complaining about Ingersoll because they said his dam is causing the banks to start to wash away. Once they get this wall built and they put this dam across here, Ingersoll files a suit against them and said, you've backed your water up on my dam and my mill won't work anymore. So he takes it to the Alabama Supreme Court and they ruled in his favor. And they said, you got to do something about it. Well, what do Howard and Eccles do? They take it to the Georgia Supreme Court. Guess what they ruled? 
Make a long story short, it ends up in the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Columbus. Why? Well, let's back up a little bit. Georgia was a poor colony. It means they didn't have a lot of money. They were always struggling for money. They're, they're, they have, don't have an industrial base. Back when the definition of the territory is that it went all the way to the Mississippi River, the state government in Georgia got involved with some, there was a lot of money passed hands in the legislature and they put up select companies to sell some land down in Yazoo, Mississippi. And that gets to be real complicated that the governor's involved, whatever else. That goes to the courts and the court says, you don't have the right to do that. And uh, they end up having to pay a lot of money to a lot of people. Now they're really in debt. Well, the federal government's standing there and they said, look, this is no problem. We've been wanting to separate these territories off. We'll buy them off of you and that'll solve your debt problem, or at least temporarily. So the federal government steps in and they buy those territories and that's the Mississippi Territory. Then Mississippi becomes a state and then later the next year Alabama becomes a state. But in that dealing, Georgia, Georgia guys are pretty smart. When they draw the line and they give up the territory, where did they draw the line? Was it in the middle of the river? Let's be fair and equal. Let's put it, let's spit it right down the middle. No, it's the high water mark on the Alabama side. And everything changed. If you go today and stand on the Dillingham Street Bridge, Chuck has to do it every once in a while. He gets halfway across on that bicycle and he got to take a break and he, he, he looks up the river and he looks over on the Columbus side and it's all those beautiful mills and all what's going on over there and he look on the Alabama side and says, those la lazy son of a guns, look over there, they never did anything. Why didn't they do anything? They couldn't. Because from that day forward, they couldn't. In fact, Godwin in partnership with a man out of Appalachicola, built a big warehouse right on Holland Creek. It was in the process of putting a dock out to it so they could boat, uh, uh, bring boats up to it. That was over. My grandmother was a charter member in First Methodist Church of Phoenix City, Alabama that started in that warehouse. And after they built their own church, the Baptists started a church there and then it was tore down. That's all it was ever used for. Because... If you can't build a dock out there anymore, the rivalry is over. Guess what happened? Dreams realized and dreams denied. It wasn't that the people on the Alabama side were lazy. They were coming on strong. That court case changed the world. Columbus wins. Here's Lupo. Ultimately, Ingersoll's Gerard failed to become a true rival to Columbus. The dispute over whether Alabama had right to use the water power or to build wharfs on, into the river reached the U.S. Supreme Court in the early 1850s. The court affirmed that only Georgia River Bank owners enjoyed the rights and were unable to use the river. Girard never became a commercial or manufacturing center. It remained a suburb or a bedroom community rather than a rival of Columbus. My relative who had settled over there this is his obituary. Mr. Collins was born in, in South Carolina in 1824, 10 years later, four years old, came for, before the founding of Columbus. Uh, after the founding of Columbus, he moved with his parents to Girard. This was before Girard was founded and while there were many Indians in the surrounding territory, Mr. Collins has seen the endeavor of Girard to outrival Columbus as a city and seen her become an important suburb of a one-time rival. And another, by, uh, Obituary, it said, Mr. Collins was always a firm believer in the future of Gerard, and only in recent years did he give up the idea, even though still hoping to see it become an important town. Changed the world. Changed everything about that, and it changed a lot of other things that's happening. But I want you to, I want to jump ahead here a little bit, and this is a better picture of how that wall worked. This system over here never worked. So even though Georgia won the battle, that system never worked, the hydraulics never worked on it. 
uh, it was always a battle. You, we talked today about we've become such a litigious country. We're always suing each other. You ought to study uh, Columbus history. <laughs> They were suing each other left and right. And I'm sure in some of the deeds you've had to go back through, you've seen it. It's unbelievable, the suits that were going on. They, it was every day they were, they were fighting two or three lawsuits. But this system never was. Some of the water lot owners were suing others, and the, it, the water lots and stuff changed hands. It got very complicated. This system never worked. It never worked until Eagle and Phoenix built its own dam. And that's when things changed. Okay. The most northern part of the water lots was the Coweta Falls uh, Dam. Initially, it became a Grant Dam. And then, when the Swifts came in, that was plant number one for them. Of course, it had been burnt and rebuilt. Then they built number two there. And then they moved across the road and built number three. Here we go. So one and two's here, three's here. What does that happen? That that really changes the world here too, because number three is across the road, and it could only be done when steam-driven mills were possible. This is the first steam-driven mill. Now you say, well, didn't they have steam-driven mills in 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 uh, England? Yeah, in the 1700s they did but not in the United States. They only came in here really after the Civil War and more toward uh, the 1870s, 80s, 90s does this start to happen here. But it was pretty rapidly after that that they built number four, which is the new change, and that is electricity. Only in bill number four. And then they built number five, number six, number seven, and I think it ends at seven or eight. But all this changes rapidly. Now, if you move on up the river, you got the same issue. And this is where Rock Falls is. And this is probably going to be hard to see. I mean, a Rock Island. There was literally a place called Rock Island. And it was built to create, it was a paper mill because they, they were selling all the old rags and all out of the mills up north turn them into paper and selling the paper back. So what do they do? They said, you know, we're not going to do this. So Winter and, 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 the, and uh, Fontaine and those guys end up building a paper mill. But they had the same problem. If you look down on the channel today, about half of this island still exists. Uh, but as you can still see it, it's one closer to the Alabama side. If you look down here, you say, there's the channel. But if you ever watch the water low, this is all rock. Here's the channel. That's the reason they put it on this side. But by then, they own this. And this is Rock Island Paper Company. But what really, and this is, Jesse and I went down, and we actually found this is part of the, uh, the, the dam that went across. But this is what really happened. But what happens a little further down below that is the big change too because on the, it, it, at Bibb City, which belonged to the Cook family, there the channel actually goes to the Georgia side. You got a big fall there, the biggest one in this part of the country, uh, close to Columbus. And you got a big fall there and where the channel runs over here by Rock Island, it goes back across Okay, I'm glad to get on that here. There's no way I'm going to have time to get into all this. It get a lover's leap, and there is a rock, and it is still there, but you've got to know where you're looking to be able to see it on the back side of that mill. It used to be real prominent, and it was called Lover's Leap, and there's an India Lover story that goes along with it that's very interesting. Uh, my friend James Hall 
who's here, won't tell me where he found this picture, but he did. This is when they're building the build down and there's Lover's Leap. This was huge because now you had power that drove the lights and some of the railroad system of the early on uh, down at, at City Mill. But now they're producing so much power up with this. The original dam had to be rebuilt. It was a problem. Hardaway comes back and does it right. But now you got Columbus Manufacturing. W.C. Bradley is really the key person in that. It's dry, it's, this mill's driving it and the bib and creates the opportunity for a Meredith mill, which becomes the Anderson mill, which becomes part of the bib mill. Uh, all of those mills driven up here and also, you're driven, this is where your power is produced for the city. So you've got a lot of things going on up there. What's really interesting, when you look at these two powerhouses, and you look at this shaft, and Jesse's got some really good pictures of it, and I've seen them several places. This shaft right here, you know what's going on in here? These are ropes that this powerhouse was back when he was using water power, was turning these ropes, and even with the turbines, and turning this whole mill. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. If you go down here and walk behind the Eagle and Phoenix mill, and you look over at the powerhouse, you can look up there, and you can see where there were shafts where the ropes ran across into the mill on the buildings. And then you can look up and see where later on the electricity ran over across. But a lot happened. All right. We're running, I read the other day where it's really neat. They're doing all of this uh, improvements on uh, city um, mill and people are starting to refer to it as the city village. Well, it's actually a historic name. It was developed using the term city village way back. But there were a lot of problems here. Floods were a problem. Fire was a problem. Getting water was a problem. This is the uh, waterworks in Phoenix City. When Leonard Mills could no longer supply the needs of the city, uh, they had to bring water from the uh, Sunville area all the way down. Malaria, yellow fever was a problem. And so this is Esquiline Hill. What you have found now is that to get away from some of these problems, uh, the wealthy people in Columbus had hills. They bought hills. And I can walk you through all those if we had time. But those hills were some of neighborhood in Phoenix City. That was the Hardaways and the Fontaines and the Stewarts. That's where they lived in the summer because they wanted to get their family out of the... This was some marshland. It was, it, was, it was a very dangerous place to live in the summer with malaria and yellow fever and other diseases. So they went and moved. One of the reasons they built the, the Northern Bridge. So there were a lot of issues. The other issue was, and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to close with this point. While all this is going on here, to get you to see this bigger picture, what was going on here is that in the 1830s, uh, Charleston doesn't like all the shipping that, that Savannah and Augusta are getting from down here and what's going down the Chattahoochee. They're getting left out of a lot of shipping. So what do they do? They build a railroad from Charleston to Augusta, which is on the Savannah River. Then they continue it on to Atlanta. That's, the, that's in the 30s. And we go through in the 30s all the way up to the 50s. Savannah gets, because of that, they get teed off. So they build to Macon. Then they build south. Columbus, you got some guys that have the vision. You have... G. B. Gumby Jordan and, and some of those guys had the vision. But every time they got started, money was a problem. In 37, when they were really going to get on this because they realized they needed to get on these railroad lines, 
they realized that you had 1837, you had a bad economic downfall. Banks, every bank in Columbus fell in except one, and that was owned by Winter, who was mayor, and he loaned money to the city to keep it afloat. They got waylaid. Every time they got started, they got waylaid. In the meantime, you got a road, a railroad coming from the state, putting money in the railroad, going from Atlanta to um, Chattanooga, up at least to the Tennessee line. You got all these. And then you got Atlanta building a railroad from Atlanta to Montgomery. So now you're sending things out west and bringing things up from out west. All these railroads going on, we're isolated down here. We're, we're late getting into the party. Every time we get started, we, it was 1853 before we ever built a railroad that went all the way down to Fort Valley to connect to, making the collect to, to connect to Atlanta or to connect to Savannah. It's also in the 1850s when you build a spur that takes you across the bridge up here, Railroad Street in Phoenix City, and takes you over to Opelika to connect to the Atlanta Montgomery. And where does that go through? It goes through West Point. We missed all the railroad connections. We stayed behind in it. So now we're back to the old problem that we had. We missed the railroads. Now why is that important? A couple of things, again, for time reasons, I'm going to make this real simple and get to the short of it. But if you go back to the Federal Road, it was on the highlands. When the railroads came in, they needed to be on low flat land close to water. They're steam engines. So like the Federal Road through Russell County, it went through Uchi and Sanford. And families like the Hurts and the Longs, that's where they live. That's where they are buried today. But they ended up moving down to Hutsboro because they owned that land and that's where the railroad went through. One of the biggest, most prosperous towns, some of the richest people and nicest homes were in Volula in Russell County. Nobody's there anymore. They moved down to Seal. That's where the railroad went. I wrote a paper about Glenville. Glenville was the first town, the Glens, who ended up starting Auburn University. They had a big college there. They fought the railroad coming through. Bad mistake. So where the railroads went, the roads followed. The town started. So that's where your major roads are. That's where your towns are developing. And guess what happened years later when interstates get built? Where do you build the interstates? Well, where the major roads and the towns are. So if you want to go through Alabama, the old way, you go up through 29 and you go all the way to, make, uh, to Atlanta, right? Well, let's start at West Point. A lot of times when I'm going up the interstate to West Point, if I get in a wreck or something, I just jump across the railroad track and get on 29 and I can go all the way to Atlanta. Why? Because 29 parallels the railroad and the interstate parallels both of them. The Montgomery to Atlanta Railroad, it goes through West Point to Montgomery and the interstate follows it. So why did we get left off the railroad? Why did we get left off the interstates in Columbus and we had to forge a, a, a spur to get to it? Because we were late in the railroad race. It impacted where cities were located, where major roads were built and where the interstates followed. And the impact on transportation. And what happened to Atlanta? In 1860, even in 1860, Columbus was slightly larger than Atlanta. What about today? Now, I don't want to be in Atlanta, but that's a different story. But from an economic development perspective, why? It was the intersection of the railroads. And it made dreams realized and dreams denied. We started off as a transportation hub, but we never developed as a transportation hub. And in the 18, late 1800s, you had Sanford Hall at Auburn. You had that Sanford give a speech in Columbus. And there was a big movement in Columbus. Dredge the rivers. 
dredge the rivers, we got to take over and beat these railroads still in the late 1800s. Can't do it. This river is dangerous. Steamboats, you think they built those steamboats and they last for years? Those things were blowing up, getting hitting snags. They were being destroyed all the time. The river is dangerous. It's hard to keep that river clean. Even in our, some of our lifetime, we saw the last effort to keep that river dredged and to build docks. It's just too expensive. It's too hard. But we still kept trying to fight and develop that river. And other things hurt the people that wanted to build the railroad. But missing out on the railroads was a life changer. And we did well. We've done great as a city. We've had some great leaders that did great things in the city. But what it could have been had we just caught on that railroad piece of it. So the federal road was important. The river was important. But when we missed the railroads, it's really put us in an uphill battle ever since. And we've done good things. And we've not only survived, we've prevailed. But it's been a problem. And it's made life harder every step of the way. Thanks for listening to me ramble. Thank <laughs> you.